It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 137.8. We'll have a bit of an introduction and then go back to our subject in Galatians. But Psalm 137.8 is a verse that deals with what happened today in history. And what happened in today in history is Abu Musab al-Sarkari is dead. He was bombed. And they showed his dead face on television, and we should all cheer about that. And the Iraqis did cheer about it, and we should cheer about it too. And I saw on the news today they would uh, put up some Catholic priest and say, you know, we're glad evil is done away with, but you really shouldn't cheer when uh, somebody dies, etc. And they were being very liberal about it. Of course you can cheer, and this is part of it. Psalm 137, 8. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction. Babylon, by the way, the original Babylon was founded in Iraq. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is he who repays you for what you've done to us. And if you remember, on September 11th, something happened to us, and even before that, it was Abu Musab al-Zarqawi who bombed the USS Cole, put a big hole in it, and killed, I don't know, maybe 7 to 11 soldiers, I don't know exactly. But he attacked us, and we didn't do anything about it then. We have a new president now, and we're doing something about these terrorists, these despicable people. And what's the Bible say? Happy is he who repays you for what you've done to us. There's a lot of happy soldiers today, I guarantee you. A lot of happy soldiers. And I was just imagining as I saw that jet lay down those two big 500-pound bombs on that house, I was just imagining because the people who go on these missions at first, they don't know what they're doing. Well, they know, they say, you need to attack this place. It's a high-value target meaning get it and don't miss, and they won't. This is a high-value target, hit it, and that's all they know. And I can just imagine being that uh, soldier flying that F-16 and waking up this morning, looking on the news and seeing that high-value target is Abu uh, or um, Zakari. I could just imagine that he would feel pretty happy. He's got a lot to write home about. Say, you saw that on TV? That was me. I bombed that man. And if and, uh, there is happiness uh, uh, behind that. And that's what the Bible teaches. And so we're repaying these people for what they've done to us, and it's long overdue, and it's about time it's happened. So I just wanted to do that as an aside as we continue to move through Galatians. And the subject of Galatians is you're saved by faith and not of works. And most people today think you're saved by works, by what you do. Some people even think that uh, works will get you into heaven after you die. And uh, I believe even some Catholics think that after you die, you go to St. Peter and you have to answer some questions. If you answer the questions, then you'll get to go into heaven. And so some people have made some jokes out of that. For example, there was a woman who had a long, prolonged illness. And then she died and she arrived at the gates of heaven. And as she arrived there, she was waiting for St. Peter to greet her. And as she peeked through the gates of uh, heaven, she saw her mother and her family and her father. And she saw a lot of people who had died before her. And they saw her peeking through and they called to her and said, Hello, we've been waiting for you. Good to see you, etc. So then uh, St. Peter comes along and he asked the woman, he says, and he, uh, well, first of all, St. Peter walks by, and the woman says, My, this is such a beautiful place. How do I get in? You see, and she thinks it's by works, and we're going to note someone else who thinks it's by works in a moment. 
And uh, St. Peter says, well, you got to spell a word for me. And she said, well, which word should I spell? And uh, St. Peter said, well, spell the word love, and if you spell it correctly, I'll let you in the gates. So this woman spelled the word love, L-O-V-E. And Peter said, all right, come on in. And now about six months later, St. Peter came to the woman and said, uh, you need to watch the gates of heaven for this uh, during this day as if there's days in heaven, but this is the way people think. And so he says, you need to guard this gate. I need to go do something else for now. So while the woman was guarding the gates of he uh, heaven, her husband arrived, the one she'd left behind. And uh, the woman said, I'm surprised to see you. It was her uh, former husband. How have you been, she asked. And uh, the husband said, I've been doing very well since you died. So she looked at him kind of strange. And uh, she said, well, what would you do after I died? He said, well, I married a beautiful young nurse. You know that one that took care of you? Yeah, I married her. And then I won the lottery. And then after winning the lottery, I sold that little house that you and I lived in. And then I bought a big mansion. And then I traveled all around the world, and I bought a big boat. And I went on a vacation, and I decided to go water skiing. And I went water skiing, and um, the ski hit a rock, and the ski hit my head, so here I am. And then he said, so how do I get into heaven? And then the woman said, well, you've got to spell the word Czechoslovakia. <laughs> so he went from love to Czechoslovakia. So the thing is, people think they have to work their way into heaven, and you don't. You don't have to work your way into heaven. There's no magic word. There's no magic system to get into heaven. Just faith alone and Christ alone. And we're going to note someone in Matthew 19:16. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. And we're going to meet somebody who thinks he can work him his way into heaven. That's the basis of his whole thinking. And his thinking is not grace. His thinking is way off. Way off. And he's going to approach our Lord in Matthew 19:16. And the funny thing is, this man's no different than many people today. There are even people who believed in Christ who think that it's still by works, or they come to believe that later after they're influenced by legalism. Now, the Galatians started out believing faith alone in Christ alone. Then later, some legalists came down and convinced them otherwise and so Matthew 19, 16 is a good start for us to look at. And behold, one came and said unto him, that's Jesus Christ, and he said, Good Master. Now, in fact, when this man said, Good Master, he, he actually said, You're good of intrinsic value, but he's not saved. And we'll note this. What good thing shall I do? that I may have eternal life. You see, he's asking a question. What do I have to do to have eternal life? Just as the woman said, all right, St. Peter at the gates of heaven, what do I have to do? He said, spell love. And then she was given the gates, and she said, well, spell Czechoslovakia. That just goes to show that a lot of times people humanize God. And if God doesn't like you, well, you better work extra hard to get into heaven. It's the kind of the way people think. Or you've done something so bad on the earth, God's not going to allow you in. You've been a terrible son. But that's incorrect. And this man thinks the same way that most people think today. What good thing shall I do? doesn't depend on him, but he thinks it does. That I may have eternal life. Now this man, the rich young ruler, is following the gimmick of salvation by works. He thinks he's going to be saved by doing something good. By working by the accumulation of good deeds, and this is what most people think today as well. Now, the simple answer to this is nothing. And Christ could have answered with a simple answer, but he's going to challenge this man in a different way, in a way that only Jesus Christ could challenge this man. This man is all faith, and he thinks that the only way to have eternal life is to remain under the bondage of the law and to follow the law. And Jesus Christ right now is going to accept his premise. You see, he could have just kicked the premise out and said, Look here, boy, you're not saved by anything you do. You've got to believe in me. But the man was negative, so he's just going to follow along with the premise. And so our Lord says in Matthew 19:17, 17, 
First of all, he, he sets down the fact that this man's an unbeliever because it comes into question in Matthew 19, 16, and then the, these are some of the new things, not new, but some of the things I came up with uh, in, in order as to why our Lord answered in this way. You see, he started out and he said, good master, and that's good of intrinsic value. And now our Lord says, why do you ask me about what is good? In other words, our Lord is testing him saying, oh, you, do you really believe I'm of divine authority? Do you really believe I have good of intrinsic value? And the answer is no, he doesn't. So he says, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. And then he continues, if. And this if is a first class condition of supposition. If, and I suppose you do, is what our Lord says. If, and I suppose, this is how you want eternal life, if you want to enter into life by works, obey the commandments. That's supposition. Our Lord's not saying you have to. He's saying if you consider that you must get to heaven by your good deeds, then you better follow the commandments. Our Lord's just following his logic in order to trap him. So Jesus is asking him right here two different things. First of all, he says, why do you ask me about good? In other words, do you believe that I'm God? He would, never, he, would, he would not come to say that. He did not believe that. And so then he brings out the supposition of if, and the supposition of if is important when our Lord uses it, and he says, if you're saved by the law, you better follow it, is what he's saying. He's saying, all right, you think you're saved by the law, then follow it, every bit of it. Now in Matthew 19, 18, this rich young ruler is going to get a bit sarcastic with our Lord Jesus Christ. And actually, it's not, not really sarcasm. It's just the way he thinks. He thinks of himself as being so good. He thinks of himself as following all the rules of the Mosaic Law. So he asks our Lord in a very brash tone, which ones? See, our Lord said, all right, you want to be saved? And you think you're saved by following the commandments? Then you better follow, them all, follow all of them. And then this man comes up and says, which ones? As if he had followed all of them, he thinks he has. Which ones, the man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder. He starts out with ones this man's never done. This man's never murdered anyone. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. This man's done none of that. Do not steal. This man's never stolen. Do not give false testimony. This man's never committed perjury. Now these are four commandments that the rich young ruler has kept. But the last two our Lord mentions, he's not kept at all. Matthew 19, 19. And it's separated into Matthew 19, 19. And there's such a short verse here for one reason only. This man's not following these things. And it starts out, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not commit perjury. And this man's never done that. But then he says in Matthew 19, 19, Honor your father and mother. That's one of them. And it's one that he's obviously not followed, but he's justifying himself. And love your neighbor as yourself. This is another he's not followed. So this man has not kept the law entirely. And as we will note in James chapter 10, verse 2, if you don't follow all the law, then you've broken them all. If you mess up in one point of the law, then you've broken the entire law. And this man has not honored his father and mother. And he has not loved his neighbor as himself. And how do I know that? Because we studied Matthew, and do you remember the Korban gimmick? It was a while back, you probably don't. The Korban gimmick refers to the fact that uh, in those days you could uh, sell your land, as it were, to the temple and give it to the temple. But you, you gave it to the temple in that after your death it went to the temple. But if you use the Korban gimmick, what you're doing is saying, I can still make money off of my property. I can still raise sheep, cows, goats, whatever they did back then agriculturally, still grow things on the land and sell it, and not pay taxes on it. And why did the man not have to pay taxes? Because he had given the land to the... the, uh, the uh, the temple. And so since they'd given the land to the temple, what would happen? Well, the father and the mother would get ill, of course. They all do when they get old. And they get ill and they need some caring. 
and it's the responsibility of the children as declared in the Bible that the children take care of their parents when they get old and feeble. That's why you see on the back of uh, cars you see a uh, sticker that says be sure you take good care of your children because they're going to pick your nursing home. It's true, they will. And so when you get older, well, you children just re remember you don't get away. If they took care of you and if your, if your parents get into bad shape it's your turn to take care of them. But they're using a core bond gimmick. And the core bond gimmick would say, I can't take care of you because I've given everything to the temple, which was a lie, but they would use it as a gimmick. And they'd say, I can't take care of you. I can't pay for you. I've given all my money to the temple. So you might as well go out and die, is what they would tell them. And this was not part of the law. And this is the way this man functioned. He obviously had used this core bond gimmick. And that's why Jesus Christ emphasizes, honor your father and mother. And then our Lord goes on and says, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the emphasis of Jesus is on love your neighbor as thyself. And that is something in which the rich young ruler has erred. The rich young ruler has not loved his neighbor as himself. He hasn't even loved his mother and father. He thinks he has, and he would justify that part of it because it's so vicious. Somebody were to say, you don't even take care of your father and mother. He would justify that and he would get all upset as in most family matters people get very upset and not uh, very objective at all but he goes to the one love your neighbor as yourself and this is something he hasn't done and this is something he knows he hasn't done and this is where the rich young ruler has erred and as the Bible says if you are guilty of breaking one commandment of the law you're breaking of command you're guilty of breaking every command of the law so Jesus here accepts the premise of the young rich ruler so that he can show him that his system of salvation is wrong. You cannot be saved by following the Mosaic law. And the rich young ruler has not kept the law. It's impossible for any man to keep the entirety of the law and therefore he should follow Jesus Christ into regeneration which will be noted. Matthew 19.20 19, Matthew 19.20 Now our Lord gave him this list now he's in self-justification and he is not going to admit that he hasn't honored his father and mother and he's not going to admit that he hasn't loved his neighbor as himself. So he says to our Lord, very uh, in bragging almost, all these things I have guarded from my youth. Now why does he say from his youth? He knows something about the age of accountability. He knows that you're not accountable until a certain age. And if you're three, two, three years old, you're not accountable. If you're 14, 15, in most cases you are. In those cases where you aren't, it's because the person is extraordinarily retarded or if something else is wrong with his brain, and God takes care of that. So all these things I have guarded from my youth, meaning since the time I was accountable to guard these things, I've guarded them. So then the young man asked, very self-righteously, what do I still lack? He still hasn't caught on yet. Matthew 19, 21. Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Now, is anyone saved by giving their possessions to the poor? No. Our Lord Jesus Christ, for the sake of argument, is simply following his logic. He's following how this man thinks. And this man thinks that he can be saved by following the law. Now there's one thing he hasn't done. He hasn't loved his neighbor as himself. He's a penny pincher. He is a, a what you would call him greedy. And he is very wealthy, rich, but he doesn't like to part from his money and he has not helped the poor. So our Lord Jesus Christ throws this up in his face because our Lord knows this. Our Lord knows, yeah, this man, he's, he's all right in that he's kept a lot of the law, but he's messed up on this one point, There's, therefore he's messed up in all of it. So Jesus Christ is showing this man that he has violated a commandment, and therefore, since he's violated one commandment, he's guilty of them all. And so the, rich, the point he's trying to make is the rich young ruler cannot be saved by following the law, and you cannot be saved by your good deeds. 
and you cannot be saved by giving all of your money away. That's what our Lord's telling him. You can't be saved by giving away all your possessions and giving them to the poor. That's why he ends by saying, then come, follow me. And you say, well, that looks a bit confusing. It'll get straightened out in a moment. Matthew 19, uh, 28 actually does straighten it out. So we just went over Matthew 19, 21. Look at Matthew 19, 28, and our Lord just uh, straightens them out. Now, I looked at the NIV translation, and the NIV translation, oddly enough, this time wasn't as good as the King James. And then Jesus said to them, and this is the King Je uh, the NIV, I tell you the truth, the renewal of all things. Now that's not, that means nothing to you, does it? I tell you the truth at the renewal of all things. That means nothing. And in fact, in the King James Version, it, it says, I tell you the, uh, the truth at the point of regeneration. And that's actually more correct. I tell you the truth at the point of regeneration. Faith alone in Christ alone is regeneration. When the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me in regeneration will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This is our Lord's answer. Now in verse 21, he's following the premise. So let's look at the premise again. If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. Now you have to look at verse 28 to put it into perspective. You who have followed me. Now in between this time, uh, Peter and all them have been asking, well, oh, look, Lord, I followed you here, there, and everywhere. Am I not going to be rewarded for following you here, there, and everywhere? And our Lord says, yes, you will be rewarded. Why? Because you have followed me in regeneration, and you will produce Peter. You will produce some things later under the filling of the Spirit. So what it's referring to is the fact you will have treasure in heavens, referring to believers who produce divine good will receive treasure in heaven, and they've already followed our Lord. And that's the whole answer to it. And it kind of switches it around for one reason only, to bring this man to the point where he knows the law can't save him. And the reason why our Lord just didn't sit him down and say, look, the law can't save you, believe in me, is because the man was negative. And so he taught him this way for our benefit so that we could see it's not on the basis of the law. So now to Matthew 19:22. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. He wasn't going to believe in Christ. He was depending on his wealth. And our Lord knew it. And our, this is why our Lord brought it out. Our Lord knows everything. And he knew everything about this man. And he knew that this man had a real big hang-up in life, arrogance related to wealth. He was a wealthy man. Anything that he wanted done, he could get done because he could pay for it. And he actually, after a while, began to think, well, I can even be saved by my wealth. Probably even why it came to our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe I could buy this man off, get in, get in good with this prophet, and that's what he thought our Lord was. Our Lord was more than a prophet. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, because this man was stingy, he'd violated two commandments. He had violated the korban. Well, he had used the korban as a gimmick, therefore violating the commandment, honor your father and mother. He wasn't going to take care of his parents, even though he was so wealthy. And he had violated love your neighbor as yourself because he was greedy and our Lord knew it and that's why our Lord brought out those two commandments. Extraordinarily greedy. And then our Lord will go on to talk about how it's hard for a man who depends on his wealth to be saved and that's true. Matthew 19.23 Matthew 19.23 Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, Verily, verily, I say unto you means I'm about to make a point of doctrine. Excuse me. I tell you the truth. It is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. What's that mean? Well, you've got to know something about the eye of the needle. It's not talking about a sewing needle. Any of you ladies who sew, or lady who sews, you know that oftentimes it's hard to thread a needle. 
And you could make application from that, but that's not what the eye of the needle is. It's not a sewing, it's not a sewing needle. In the ancient world, they usually built walls around a city. And within the wall, they would have, let's say, here's the wall of the city. Then they would have a gate, and here's the gate. Now at nighttime, they would close the gate to keep the enemies out. And it was a large gate that camels and everything else could go through. But they would close it at night. And then, let's say you came to the city, you had traveled a long way, and it's one o'clock in the morning, and you have a camel. Well, they had built a door called the Eye of a Needle, just big enough for a camel to go through but it's hard for the camel to get through it. And so they would have a guard at this door, and let's say you're traveling a long way on this camel up this road, and then you come to this door, and the man at the door sees who you are and makes sure you're not an enemy or a spy, and if you're coming to do business or whatever and you need to go get a hotel, the guard would say, all right, come on through, but he would not open the whole gate. He would make him go through the eye of the needle this little bitty thing here and the camel's pretty big so it would and with all the equipment and stuff on it that they're carrying they'd have to shove it through and a camel's just as stubborn as a jackass so it would uh, make noises that camels make and it didn't want to go through but it would have to go through and so our Lord is saying it's possible for a rich man to go through just like it's possible for a camel to go through but it's hard difficult difficult for a camel to go through. It's possible, but it's difficult. And that's what the passage means. It's not impossible. It's difficult. So again, um, then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth. It is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they understood this because they lived in that culture. And they understood that going through the eye of the needle with a camel is pretty tough. And they also understood it was possible. But remember, these uh, Peter at this time and all the disciples are knuckleheads. And they're about to be knuckleheads again. In Matthew 19:25, uh, it says this. Matthew 19:25. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? When the disciples heard this, they were astonished. Now that means they're knuckleheads. They're already saved. They believed in Christ. They should know the answer. It shows how little doctrine they know, and they know very little. You here sitting here today, you young people sitting here today, probably know more than Peter did at this point. That should be encouraging to you. You probably know how you're saved. If I were to ask you after church, I won't. It's none of my business. But if I were to say, how are you saved? You would probably say, I believed in Christ. But here's Peter and all the disciples. They don't even know how they were saved. They've been saved. They still don't even know. And they've been hanging around with our Lord who's been teaching them doctrine. That shows the importance of the power of the Spirit in your life. <laughs> so the disciples were greatly astonished at this. And that just shows how stupid they are. So then in Matthew 19.26, I believe it's Matthew 19.26, Jesus looked at them and said, is that correct? I thought I skipped a verse. Matthew 19.26, Jesus looked at them and said, now what it means where it says Jesus looked at them, the reason why it says that. You know, we usually think of Jesus as being very nice and sweet. And when he looked at the disciples, he looked at them with doe eyes. And he looked at them and said, uh, no. What it means, he stared them down. And here's Peter and the disciples getting up saying, well, who then can be saved? So our Lord just looks at them like they're stupid. And they are. He just, look, he just stares them down. I can't, I can't believe you said that. Probably even cocked his head like a confused dog. What? And, and so Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible. That means with man you can't work your way into heaven. You idiots, you should have known that. You can't work your way into heaven. With man it is impossible. But with God all things are possible. That means God's provided salvation. 
God's provided salvation. You idiots should know that. That's why I looked at him and stared at him. Well, with man it's not possible, but with God it is. That's the basic answer he gave to him. And that's all he gave to him because I guarantee you after you teach somebody for this long and, you, and he's already told them how they were saved, after a while you just get short with them just as our Lord did. And he's not going to explain it all over to them again about salvation because if they haven't gotten it about by now what our Lord is thinking, they're not going to get it until the Holy Spirit comes. And that shows the power of the Spirit. Our Lord and his humanity couldn't even teach these idiots. They were saved. And they believed in Christ, but he still couldn't even teach them. And they didn't even, they obviously thought they could lose their salvation. They obviously got astonished and a bit scared and says, well, who can be saved? And then they got so scared that Peter says in Matthew 19, 27, this shows the self-righteousness of Peter. Uh, Peter answered him, our Lord Jesus Christ, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And note the arrogance of that, but that's Peter in his self-righteousness. And Peter has left everything, by the way. He had a wonderful uh, fishing business. He wasn't just a fisherman. He had a fishing business. If you ever watch on the Discovery Channel, these people who go fishing for crab out in Alaska and ice starts to build up on their boat, etc. It's a very dangerous job. Well, they're more than fishermen. They have a business. And Peter was more than a fisherman. It was his business. And you might call yourself a fisherman, but we do it for pleasure. We don't do it so that we can have food on the table. We might eat our fish, but we don't need to. We could just as easily and probably cheaper go to a store and get it. But not then. He was, he was in the business of being a fisherman. And so Peter answered him and said, I've left everything, that great fishing business and everything else to follow you. What then will, will there be for us? Then in Matthew 19, 28. And Jesus said unto them. Now our Lord didn't chew them out. He could have at this point, but he didn't. And, and, and the way it's coming out is our Lord is just uh, re realizing there's, there's not going to be any hope of them learning any doctrine until the Holy Spirit comes along. And he actually says that later. Matthew 19, 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that... Ye which have followed me, that is to follow me in regeneration, those who have believed in Jesus Christ, all eleven of them, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon the twelve thrones, the twelve tribes of Israel. And he was referring to eternal rewards. And then Matthew 19.29 goes on to describe those eternal rewards. So let's take down seven points from the rich young ruler. This passage describing the rich young ruler. Seven points. First of all, the rich young ruler did not recognize Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Point number one, the rich young ruler did not recognize Jesus Christ as the Son of God. He recognized him as a good teacher, even good of intrinsic value teacher, but he wouldn't go so far as to say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Point number two, the rich young ruler wanted to be saved by works, as we noted. That's why he said, what, must good, what good thing must I do to enter into eternal life? Or what, mu what, mu what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And you don't do good things to get into heaven. But this is the way this man is thinking. Thirdly, since the rich young ruler was trying to be saved by keeping the law, Jesus demonstrates to him that no one is saved by keeping the law. Jesus Christ demonstrates to him that no one is saved by keeping the law because he pulls out some things this man couldn't even keep. And this man was zealous for the law. He was a rich man and a very religious man and he did keep the law. Some of you may know rich people who keep the law very well. And they're miserable. And so was this man. And he goes away sad. And I've witnessed to many people who, after I've witnessed to them, walk away sad. They thought they could do it on their own and they're not about to believe that, that uh, Jesus Christ did it all. They just won't believe it. It's part of being negative 
toward the gospel, and then that's their choice. And everyone you witness to is not going to believe in Christ. Some will and some won't. And when some people don't, don't let that discourage you. That's their choice. And don't beg them either. God the Holy Spirit's going to do all that work for you. And they may walk away sad, and then maybe 20 years later they're laying on their deathbed, and they finally believe. And in fact, uh, the Bible tells us we should give them two chances. If you run into somebody and witness to them and they say no, you have the obligation to give it to them one more time if the opportunity arises. And if they say no the second time, wash your hands of them. Say forget it. If they're going to believe later, God will use someone else to witness. But as far as you're concerned, so that you don't keep on begging and begging, leave them alone. I've had to do that with people I really like in my life. You will too. And you can't beg them because God the Holy Spirit has a power far greater than begging and oftentimes it'll just turn them off. So I've given people two times and then I've shut up about it. And usually after two times they don't even bring it up either so neither am I. That's the way the Bible has uh, told us to do it and that's the way I'm going to do it and it's the way we should all do it. Fourth principle. When the rich young ruler asked which law, Jesus Christ used two laws to demonstrate the ignorance of the rich young ruler and to demonstrate that the rich young ruler was a sinner. The rich young ruler was walking around as if he had never sinned since the point of accountability. He said, ever since my youth, I followed every law. Notice the arrogance of it. And there are some people who think that way today. Or what they will say today is, once I got saved, I followed every taboo ever made. And I never once have broken a taboo. Therefore, that's why I'm saved. In fact, they'll say I was saved from my sins. No, you weren't. You were saved, uh, you were saved from the penalty of sin, Adam's original sin, but you're still a sinner. 1 John 1.8 and 1 John 1.10 make that clear. It just shows the ignorance of people and the arrogance and this rich young ruler really points it out. Point five. When he claimed he kept all the commandments from the moment of accountability, Jesus taught him something, and he taught them that he had not kept and had no intention of keeping the last law, which was to love his neighbor as himself and to give away his money. Now our Lord made it dramatic and said, give away all your money to the poor. This man wouldn't give away a nickel to the poor. And the reason why he made it so dramatic was so that he just could not wiggle out of it. And the reason why he hung his head and walked away sad was because he knew he was a greedy SOB. He realized he had broken the law. But he had no positive volition. And, and once learning that you're a sinner, you see, that's what the law is given for, so that we can learn we're a sinner. You know, it's the same principle. Why do people put fences around their houses and around their property? So that other people can know when they're trespassing. And that's what the law is for us. It's a fence. So that we can know when we trespass. And we all have. We've all trespassed the law. And so you have a fence around your property. Somebody hops over that fence. They're trespassing. And they know it. Now, if you didn't have a fence there, and uh, they weren't from around here and didn't know the property lines, well, they could walk all over the place and not know who owns it and not even know they're in the wrong. So what do people do? They put up fences and no trespassing signs so that people know that when they trespass, they're trespassing. That's why the law was given, so that we know that we've trespassed. And our Lord made it clear to this rich young ruler that he had trespassed. And instead of saying, well, yes, I have. You see, he was arrogant. He never came around to saying, you know, you're right, good teacher. I have trespassed. And he never came around to saying, well, since I've trespassed, now what should I do? And because he never came around to that, it shows the fact that he was negative. He, he, he was too arrogant to even... He just justified himself. He was too arrogant to even admit he'd been wrong, even though he knew it. And that's why he hung his head and ran away sad. And obviously it was probably sad for our Lord to let him hang his head and run away, but our Lord knew, as the God-man, this man did not care for the gospel. He was going to get to heaven by his own works. 
and he was going to justify everything he's ever done, and he's never going to accept our Lord as Savior. Our Lord knew it, so our Lord didn't bother with him. So point, uh, are we on point five? Now point six. Point six. Since the, since the rich young ruler had not kept one commandment, that one that we know of, that he did not treat his neighbor as himself. Since the rich young ruler had not kept one commandment, he was guilty of all. Let's look at James 2.10. Turn in your Bible to James 2.10. Legalists love the book of James. I do too. James 2.10. I love it for different reasons because I know what it means. And James even knew that you weren't saved by the law. James, the one who went in for the law later, at this point, at the writing of James, he himself knew you weren't saved by the law and wrote about it. James 2.10. I wish I'd been teaching James when the prophet was here. James 2.10. It wouldn't have made a hill of beans difference, though. James 2.10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. That's James. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. And that's true. And who has kept the whole law? There's only one man who's ever kept the law and fulfilled it, and that's Jesus Christ. That's why there's no other name under heaven given among men by which man can be saved except our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why James brings it out. And there are other things in James we will go over that seem contradictory, but they're not. He's talking about experiential sanctification, not positional sanctification. It's technical theological terms. And once we get to the point where we can handle James, we'll go over it. Some people wouldn't be able to handle it right now, I don't think. So point number seven, point number seven, really if it were up to me to do it all over again, as soon as I finished Matthew, I went into Galatians because Matthew's harsh on the legalist and then Galatians kind of cinches it up for us. Point number seven, the failure of the rich young ruler was that he failed to follow the Lord in regeneration and that's what's mentioned in Matthew 19:28 that ye which have followed me in regeneration. King James actually got that one right. So the failure of the rich young ruler was that he failed to follow the Lord in regeneration. That's why our Lord said, then follow me. He gave him the chance, but he wasn't interested. He didn't hang around. See, once, once he was sad, once he had been chewed out by... You see, our Lord didn't really chew him out, but once he felt convicted, and this happens to a lot of people... And, of course, you are convicted by God the Holy Spirit. And a lot of times someone will finally realize a point that they would have never understand apart from the Holy Spirit revealing it to them. They get scared and run away. I've witnessed to people like that. They finally understand the issue and they hang their head low and run away. Because they never understood it before. It was something they mocked and made fun of. They mocked and made fun of Christianity. But now it had come very clear to them... Maybe this could be right. Maybe you are saved by Jesus Christ. I know I'm a sinner, they'll say to themselves. Maybe this is the only way. And instead of accepting that they were wrong, they'll hang their head and walk away. It's very sad. I've had uh, people do that. I hope they believe later. And uh, by the way, Al, Z Al Kari, who never believed in uh, Jesus Christ, is burning in hell now. <laughs> <laughs> The purpose of the law, I laugh because he beheads Americans. Now there's a purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is found in Galatians 3.19. Let's flip it now to Galatians 3.19. Galatians 3.19. And I can laugh because I saw the video. It would make you sick if you saw it. Of this man, he personally did it. Al, Zar Al uh, Zarkari, the one who's dead today. He personally beheaded this young man. Now, the young man was off his rocker, but he didn't deserve to be beheaded. And he beheaded this young man, and he did it for seven minutes. 
he did it slowly like he was carving up a turkey and that boy screamed and screamed and he probably wasn't a believer and uh, the blood was going everywhere it was very sickening so the fact that this man's dead and burning in the eternal inferno I cheer it you should too so 319 an evil man Galatians 319 what then was the purpose of the law what then was the purpose of the law? You see, Paul's just gone in and talked about how you don't need to follow the law. And so the Galatians are asking, well, if we don't need to follow the law, then what was its purpose? That's a legitimate question. Then Paul goes on and answers it. It was added because of transgress transgressions until the seed, Jesus Christ. You should have seed capitalized in your Bible, meaning Jesus Christ. Until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. Now the last half has some meaning too, which we will go over tomorrow, but we need to go over the first half now. And what's the first half say of Galatians 3.19? The law was added to make man see their sins as a transgression. The law is a teacher. It teaches us that we're sinners. And that's what our Lord was trying to do to the rich young ruler. He was trying to teach him first that he was a sinner. And then after knowing that he was a sinner, he had a chance to follow up and say, well, now what? I admit I've broken the law. Now what? But he was too arrogant to do that. So the law was added to make men see that they are transgressors in order that you might understand your sins in terms of transgression. The law was added. And again, that's why you have a fence around your property. We have a fence around ours. And we all have probably different looking fences. But most people, if they're not in the country, one thing about living in the country oftentimes, you don't need a fence. Unless you have cows and all of that, then you can put up a nice, pretty, white, wooden picket fence. It'd be nice to live in the country. But anyway, people put fences around their property to show that somebody to show someone that they could be transgressing on the property. And the same thing is what the law was used for. So the seed mentioned here is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he came to provide for all mankind what mankind cannot provide for themselves. And that's salvation. And that means that man is helpless. And the most evil thing that has ever been said is that God helps those who help themselves. That's evil and it's wrong. It's satanic. God doesn't help those who help themselves. God helps the helpless. And who are helpless? We all are. We don't even breathe apart from the grace of God. We're all helpless. We all have certain things we must do in our Christian way of life, but we're still all helpless. And we could all drop dead tonight. We could all get the bird flu tomorrow. Who knows? But we're all helpless. And God's chosen the time, manner, and place of our death. And uh, God has everything in control, and that means we're helpless, and God does not help those who help themselves. That's stupid. It's stupid thinking. It's satanic thinking. It's the thinking of works. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning the things we've noted. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.